What's up, everybody? Welcome to Neil's not so boring world of chemistry. Let's go into the lab and take a deep look. In today's video, we're taking a closer look at this equation. My intention is, of course, to explain to you how it can be used to solve problems in a thermodynamics unit, whether it's a first year or even AP chemistry class. But before we do that, we want to make sure that we understand what all of the variables are in this equation and how they relate to one another. If you wait till the end of the video, I'm absolutely going to give you some practice problems that you can try along with solutions so you understand how we get the right answers. But let's start with the equation itself. So when we scan this equation, we notice that there are some variables that feel very familiar to us and others look a bit strange, especially if we're new to thermodynamics. So the ones that we know and have used before are m and delta t. Now our m is going to represent mass, and that's typically expressed in the unit grams, lowercase g, right? And then we have delta t. Now the delta is a Greek character, and in math and science it means change. And of course t is temperature, so this is our change in temperature. But what do they mean by change in temperature? Well, when we're solving these sorts of problems, we're going to have a substance or a material, and it's going to start out at one temperature, that's its initial temperature, and it's going to end up at a different temperature, which is the final temperature. So we calculate the delta T by taking our final temperature, whatever value that might be in degrees Celsius, and from that number we subtract the initial temperature. Now be careful, the order is really important. Delta T has to be calculated as temperature final minus temperature initial. So now we're left with Q and C, and those may feel a little bit more foreign. So let's start with Q. Q represents thermal energy. Um, in more common terms, this is heat. Let's take a deeper look using a simulation at what thermal energy or heat really means. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Q, which as we said is thermal energy, and it's measured in the unit joules. And in order to help you understand what Q actually is, I want to use this awesome simulation that was developed by FET. And as you probably know, this is a free website where you can use all kinds of simulations related to science. So as you see here, we have a bunch of particles, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be adding a little bit of heat to them. So you'll see that as the flame starts to heat the container, these little particles of matter, probably molecules, start to move around faster. So in other words, there is heat, thermal energy, being transferred from the flame, and it's being imparted upon or given to those particles, and they're responding by having more kinetic energy and moving around. Now you'll also notice that there's a thermometer at the top of the container, and it's steadily rising. A lot of times I have students ask whether Q is the same thing as temperature, and in this simulation you can see they're clearly different. The thermal energy is what's transferred to the particles to make them move faster. And it's their average kinetic energy that is the speed that's actually detected by the thermometer. Okay, so the only part of our equation that we've yet to discuss is this lowercase c. What is it? What does it represent? It turns out it's a property called specific heat. Now every substance that we know of, from gold to water to carbon dioxide, has a specific heat value. Uh, typically, you can look it up in a textbook or Google it and find out what it is. But when you find this number, what is it really telling you? Well, let me show you an example. This is a piece of aluminum, metal. It has a low specific heat. In this beaker, I have some water. It has a high specific heat. So, this piece of aluminum, which weighs about three or four grams, and this amount of water, which also weighs about three or four grams, they have very different specific heat values. So if I was to put them over a flame for the same amount of time, the aluminum gets hot faster than the water does. That's right, because it has a low specific heat, it's easier to heat up. And because water has such a high specific heat, it takes more joules of energy to get its temperature to change. So now I'd like to go over some problems with you step by step, and I've deliberately chosen questions 
that are not as simple as plugging in information for the variables with the exception of one and then just rearranging and solving for that variable. I think you guys can probably figure those out. So let's take a look at some more complicated questions. In this one, it asks, what is the final temperature of a piece of aluminum? And you'll notice I've circled 2.3 grams in yellow, and I've also written in our equation the M in yellow as well, and that's because that's where we're gonna be putting that 2.3 grams. And this piece of aluminum has lost 30 joules of energy. So as we stated, energy lost or gained, thermal energy specifically, is Q. So that 30 is going to be connected to the Q variable in our equation, which is why it's circled in blue and it's written in blue in the equation. The initial temperature of the metal was 18.4 degrees Celsius. And then we're told that the specific heat of aluminum is 0 0.89 joules divided by grams degrees Celsius. Now the joules divided by grams degrees Celsius is just the unit for specific heat, okay? Sometimes there's some confusion. Does that mean we have to divide something or multiply something because of the unit being compounded, made up of different smaller units? But no, that's just a compound unit. Don't worry about it for now. So the specific heat is circled in pink, and you can see that I wrote the lowercase c, which is the symbol for specific heat, in pink as well. Now, what makes this question interesting is they're not asking us to find delta T. They want us to find the final temperature. But if we know the initial temperature, and then we find the delta T, or the change in temperature that has occurred, we can just apply that change to where this piece of metal started out, 18.4 degrees Celsius, and that's how we can get to the final temperature. Now, before we even get into the math, notice that it lost 30 joules of energy. So I like to think to myself, okay, if it lost energy, am I expecting the final temperature to be higher than 18.4 degrees Celsius or lower? And I hope you would agree with me that when an object loses energy, its temperature should go down. So we go into this problem expecting to have a final answer lower than 18.4 degrees Celsius. And if we don't get something smaller than that number, we may want to go back and check our work. Okay, so the first thing I'm doing here is I am going to take my Q equals MC delta T, and I'm going to rearrange it because we've decided that our best route to getting the final temperature is solving for delta T. So here you can see that I'm dividing both sides of the equation by the m times c. And that's because I wanna move that away from the delta t so it's isolated. So when I divide one side by m times c, I'm gonna divide the other side by m times c. And in green, I've crossed out the mass times specific heat on the delta t side because of course it's gonna be eliminated through division. So now I can rewrite this equation as follows. Delta t is gonna be equal to q that's our thermal energy, divided by the mass of this piece of aluminum multiplied by its specific heat. Now, when we actually go to put in those numbers, I'm just gonna kind of flip it around so that the delta T is on the left side. And now I'm gonna to start to put in those values that were given to me in the problem. So notice for the Q, up here in the question, it said it lost 30 joules of energy. Well, when energy is lost, we have to represent that as a negative. So that's a little bit tricky, I guess. And the problem, it doesn't tell us to put the negative in front of the 30 joules, but we're using context clues. Anytime energy is lost from an object or a substance, we wanna represent that with a negative sign. So that's negative 30 joules. The mass was 2.3 grams. And I'm multiplying the mass by the specific heat, which was given to us as 0 0.89 joules divided by grams degrees Celsius. So when we put all of this in our calculator, and I would advise multiplying the 2.3 times the 0 0.89 first, and then dividing negative 30 by that. And you can see in green that I'm keeping track of the units, and all the units are gonna cancel out except for the degrees Celsius, which would make sense because we are solving for a change in temperature. So temperature is usually measured in degrees Celsius. Obviously, it can also be measured in things like Kelvins or degrees Fahrenheit. But for this problem, it's degrees Celsius. So we wouldn't want the joules or the grams to be hanging around in our answer. So it's great that they cancel out in this way. When all that is put into the calculator, we find that the delta T is negative 14.66 degrees Celsius. 
Now, many, many times once we get to this point, we kind of lose sight of what the original question asked. And remember, it didn't ask for the delta T. The question asked us to solve for the final temperature. So we can't stop here. If we just submit our answer as delta T is equal to negative 14.66 degrees Celsius, we're most certainly gonna get it wrong. In order to get the final temperature, we're gonna take our initial temperature, which was 18.4 degrees Celsius that was given to us in the question, and the delta T is a loss of 14.66 degrees, so we're gonna subtract that from the 18.4, and this tells us that the final temperature is 3.74 degrees Celsius. Now, that's all well and good. We put it in our calculator, we set up the equation correctly, but does it make sense in terms of the question and what actually happened here? I think it does. We said that this piece of aluminum lost 30 joules of energy, so its temperature should drop. So it going from 18.4 degrees Celsius to 3.74 degrees Celsius makes total sense. This problem looks a bit different than the last one because we're not just dealing with one substance and its temperature change. Instead, we have a piece of copper that's been heated, and when it's placed into a beaker of much cooler water, the two objects reach the same temperature, which is 20.4 degrees. Now we're asked to find the mass of the water that was used in this experiment. Before we dive into the math and how we're gonna manipulate Q is equal to MC delta T, I wanna show you this in the lab to give you a better sense of how we're gonna approach the problem. So here you can see me heating up the 10.2 gram piece of copper, and I'm getting it to that initial temperature of 42 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, the thermometer in the water is reading about 20.2 degrees Celsius. So this piece of copper is now taking on a lot of extra thermal energy. And what's gonna happen is when I place it in the water, it's losing its thermal energy, it's losing its Q, and the water is gaining that amount of Q, which is why you see the temperature of the water increasing. So we have the loss of Q from copper equaling the gain of Q for the water sample. And we'll see that after all of this happens, it's gonna arrive at something we call thermal equilibrium, where the two temperatures of the objects are the same. So now let's take what we learned from observing this process in the lab and apply it to solving the problem. When we rearrange our Q is equal to MC delta T equation to solve for the mass of water, we find that we need three things, Q, the specific heat of water, and delta T. Delta T is easy because all the temperatures are given in the problem. The specific heat of water is simply 4.184. Now most teachers and professors ask their students to memorize that number or give it to them, let's say at the top of the exam or the quiz. But what about Q? That's not given to us in the problem. We just observed in the lab that the amount of thermal energy lost by the copper, negative Q, is the same amount of thermal energy gained by the water, positive Q. So what we can do here is solve for the Q relative to the piece of copper, and then take that same Q that we find and apply it to water. So let's start with copper first. So here you can see I've set up Q of copper is equal to MC delta T. Now all the numbers I'm plugging in for the mass, specific heat, and delta T, I've gotten from the problem. And you'll notice that I'm crossing off all the units, which leaves me with the unit of joules. Now of course, as explained, this Q value for copper is gonna be a negative number because the copper had a whole lot of thermal energy and it was lost to the water. So the value is negative 84.82 joules. And because of this thing called thermal equilibrium, we know that that's the same number of joules gained by the water, except it would be positive because again, it was gained. So it's positive 84.82 joules, which is the Q for water. So now I'm able to use my equation rearranged to solve for mass because I do have a Q value. So now we're going back to the water and we are gonna plug in that 84.82 joules we know the specific heat of water, and I'm using the final and initial temperatures given in the problem, making sure that I'm doing T final minus T initial. And when we do that, we find that the mass of this water in the beaker was 101.39 grams. Okay, so let's see whether or not this video actually helped with your understanding. 
Here's a practice problem, and I would ask that you pause the video here, read through it, and try to calculate the answer on your own. Then you can continue watching to see my full solution. So the answer is the initial temperature of the iron that was heated in an open flame was 86.1 degrees Celsius. Now, how did I come up with that? You'll see that the first thing I did was I tried to calculate the Q of the water. In other words, the amount of thermal energy in joules that the water absorbed. Once I did that, because of the concept of thermal equilibrium, I was allowed to assume that that was the same number of joules that was lost by the piece of iron. So then I use that value along with iron's mass and its specific heat to calculate the change in temperature that the iron went through. And this was negative 74.40 degrees Celsius. So in other words, the iron which was heated in a flame got really, really hot. And when it went into the water, its temperature went down by 74.40 degrees Celsius. So that means we still have to find that initial temperature, right? So if we know that delta T is equal to the T final minus the T initial, I can plug in the delta T that we calculated, also adding in the final temperature of 11.7, which was given in the problem, and that's how I got that 86.1 degrees Celsius for the final answer. Thanks for checking out the video. You can follow me on Instagram if you wanna be updated every time I release new content. And as always, I humbly ask that you subscribe to the channel and like the video if it worked for you.